Welcome to Conversations in Process, hosted by Jay McDaniel and co-sponsored by the Cobb Institute and Open Horizons. These conversations explore a way of understanding and living in the world that emphasizes the continual becoming and fundamental interconnectedness of all things. But they're also intended to provide an ongoing interaction in which the stories, insights, and wisdom of each conversation partner can expand your horizon and enrich your journey and process. In this conversation, Jay visits with three women who lead Christian congregations, Beth Hayward, Leslie King, and Terry Daly. Beth Hayward is a minister in Vancouver, British Columbia with the United Church of Canada who brings to community a warm heart, deep curiosity in others, and an infectious down-to-earth nature. Grounded on the east coast of Canada and now on the west, Beth makes time for people and space for the big open-hearted questions with which many wrestle. Whether leading worship, visiting those in crisis, or managing administrative duties, Beth brings to her ministry a deep sense of the sacredness of each moment, a multi-generational welcome, and a commitment to be authentic on the way. Leslie King began her service to the First Presbyterian Church of Waco in 2012. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Kansas University and her Masters of Divinity from McCormick Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Chicago. In 2010, she completed her Doctor of Ministry at St. Paul School of Theology in Kansas City, Missouri, with an emphasis in spirituality and organizational change. She's also a yoga instructor with a particular interest in yin and restorative yoga as it relates to spiritual well-being. Terry Daly is priest at All Saints Episcopal Church in Russellville, Arkansas. She's been a priest for 12 years, serving at St. Peter's in Conway, Arkansas for nine years before coming to All Saints on October 1st, 2017. She's also a consultant for the Hendricks Institute for Clergy and Civic Engagement. Prior to entering ordained ministry, she was a practicing pediatrician. Welcome to our conversation in process. This is the Christmas season. And today's conversation is particularly relevant to Christmas because what we're going to do is to explore some themes about what Christmas means to us and can mean for Christians to be sure, but perhaps even for everybody. I have three pastors with me. Beth Hayward, Leslie King, Terry Daly, and they're going to have a conversation. I'd like to note that having a conversation in which you seek wisdom together is itself a process practice. It involves listening to another person, hearing her stories, her ideas, responding in a sympathetic way, and seeing what insights emerge. Those insights are novel, at least new for the people in the time at hand. You'll see this conversation is itself a form of theology, but it's exploratory. It's seeking wisdom together. It's hearing the ideas and stories of, of somebody else and then seeing what happens as you listen and then respond. So in, pro in the process world, we call that theology, but it's tentative, exploratory, creative. And in this instance, it's about how we can find wisdom for daily life with themes that emerge from the Christmas season. And that's what you'll discover now. So thanks for joining us. Uh, well, thank you for being here with us this afternoon to talk about Christmas from an open and relational perspective. Uh, each of you are pastors or priests, and each is shaped by process or open and relational thinking in one way or another. And this is a time just to reflect in a casual way, informal way, about some Christmas themes. And I think that uh, Beth has decided, or I've asked Beth to go first. And um, what's your theme and what would you like to say? Well, it's, um, you know, it's so wonderful to take time out in this season that um, is so busy for us to talk about the stuff that really, um, I, I think I can speak for the others when I say, these are the themes that really get us excited talking about what in the world does this Christmas season mean for us. And so I want to start by talking about the smells of Christmas, um, which I suppose isn't something you think of uh, normally, just right off the top. But, you know, when I go back to the biblical story, I imagine um, those smells of the, the barn and the donkey, but I, I, I'm a city girl. So those, those smells, I mean, I know them, but they don't speak to my heart in the same way. So when I think of the smells of the season, I'm thinking about uh, cookies, baked 
baking, right? Gingerbread house decorating and eggnog being made. I'm thinking about the um, popcorn garlands we used to make when I was a kid and all of those smells that sort of fill a home in, in the Christmas season and leading up to it. And in this particular COVID year, when our lives have been so shaped um, by what's happening in the world, I'm, I'm just very aware that the people that I pastor and all of us are not going to be able to go home to those smells in the same way. And it's almost like those um, the preparation of the cookies and the feasts, it becomes a sacrament. It's part of our ritual of this season. And and so I'm just wondering to myself, well, what's it mean when we can't do those things in the same way? What does it mean if we have to uh, stay where we are this year for Christmas and not be able to be part of those rituals that tangibly shape our lives? And, and as I reflected on that, the smells and how I'm still going to go through the rituals this year, even though I, I might be baking all the cookies um, for myself and the kids and my husband, like they're, they're you know, will be eaten a lot because I don't know how to scale down <laughs> the uh, abundance in this season. But I keep coming back to this idea that what is it that I love about the smells of the season? It's, it's that they bring you home and they bring you back in a sense to some nostalgia. Um, but they ground you in something important too. And that idea of home, I mean, I know that there are so many for whom home is not some romantic place. It's not all good. There's, there's real abuses and violences and lack of safety and food that happens in many homes. But every one of us somewhere uh, has this memory of home, right? And for me, that's the, that's the holy place is can we, and especially in this year when our rituals are going to be uh, turned upside down, how do we tap into that sense of home? And when I speak of home, I, I guess I mean like um, a oneness, a oneness with our source, um, a sense that no matter what's happening, no matter how different things are this year or in your own lives, no matter what you're going through, can we keep finding our way back to that place of, I'm okay, I'm valuable, I'm beloved, my, my meaning in the world is not shaped by um, what others say about it, by external expectations, regrets, successes, um, and that to me is kind of like the most important message of Christmas is uh, you, you are um, an image of the incarnate, um, the Christ light in our world. Um, so I, that's where I'm going this year a fair bit is um, how do we attend to that sense of home? I, I love this quote from Fred Beekner, who, uh, you know, wouldn't call himself a process theologian, but he speaks of the kingdom of God being home. And at one point he wrote, every last one of us is homesick for the kingdom. I, I feel like we're all at some point and in some way, if we're on the spiritual journey, we're feeling a bit homesick. We're, we're feeling that need to connect to our source. Um, and I'm hoping that's the, the best gift of Christmas. If we can touch into that place um, through the really simple rituals and pay attention this year. All right, things are going to be different. How do we still um, use this time that's going to be so much more quiet, less traveling about um, as a time to tap into the oneness that holds us and grounds us and calls out the best in us. Um, Cause that's the place from which we're going to, you know, offer our best selves to the world. Um, so I'm hoping that as I'm doing my, my baking this year and uh, all of those smells start filling the house. Um, but as I'm feeling the grief of not being able to, uh, to taste those smells with so many people that I love, um, maybe in the midst of it, there'll be room for me to attend more to my own um, 
you know, what really matters and why is it, what is it about those relationships, um, that values me, um, and, and that grounds me in, uh, in my sense of holiness. That's, that's some initial thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth. And, uh, Leslie or Terry, do either of you want to respond uh, in any way to what Beth just said? I'd, I'd love to, I would love to. Um, yeah, Beth just uh, took me to, um, you know, my grandmother's house and home. And uh, these are people with whom I have so many differences. But, um, but there is such deep relationship and deep love. And it, it was a Christian environment with lots of different angles on <laughs> Christianity. Um, so. I really want to thank you, Beth, because that was a real, um, I think your emphasis on relationships and source was really meaningful. And that's not a place I could have gone, even if it wasn't COVID, without your reflections that allowed me to sort of move into that um, very mysterious space of memory. So I really appreciated what you brought up for me. Yeah, that's important to note. Uh, to, yeah, for some of us, it is our our birth, <laughs> home, and family, and um, and for others, it needs to be more chosen family that um, that feed that place in us. Uh, it's complicated. Yeah, it is. Terry, how about you? Anything to say? Yeah, thank you so much, Beth. I was thinking while you were talking about the reason that things are so different this year, which is the pandemic. And it's a pandemic in which people lose their sense of smell and taste. And so as you were talking about that, I was thinking about, um, I've never lost my sense of taste, um, never lost my sense of smell completely. Um, and I can't imagine how disorienting that would be. And so I think that was kind of just rolling around in my mind. Yeah. And, uh, so very true and it's so disorienting as people will say so um there you go thank you so it's not just a metaphor it's our reality right now for so many in our midst i'll just add one thing uh, myself i think for many people and particularly um, for some really old people that i know uh, i may be one of them uh, i think memories become sacraments and um yes the bread and wine are sacraments. Yes, the baptismal water are sacraments. Yes, the world around us is a sac sacrament. Yes, our present relationships are sacraments. But yes, memories can be sacraments. Mm -hmm. And it's the smells and also for me, especially maybe the music, um, gives me a sense of home. And the memories are home. They are a kind of home. Uh, I work with... Uh, folks with dementia and with Alzheimer's for whom that in a way is, is all they have left. But that's not so bad. When you find a pleasant memory and you rest in that memory, maybe that's your way of touching the source. Mm. And don't smells do it as well. <laughs> smells as well. Yeah, Terry, like how about you? What, what reflection would you like to offer? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I think of Easter, I always think of the morning, you know, early in the morning. When I think of Christmas, I always think of night and darkness and quiet and stillness. And, um, you know, I was thinking about why that is. And I assume it's because we just assume that Jesus was born at night. I know that in Luke, you know, it says that... Um, you know, the angels came to the shepherds who were in the field and they were watching their sheep by night. So um, and then, of course, all the the carols pick up on that. The nighttime, silent night, you know, holy night, oh, holy night and little town of Bethlehem. Um, and as I thought about that, I thought about um, what that means um, for me, what that um might mean and what that picture might stir up for some people. And I thought about um, Barbara Brown Taylor's book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. I don't know if any of you have read that. Um, 
it's it's a wonderful book. And in it, she speaks of darkness as the place where new life begins always. And, um, you know, what she ends up saying, because even, even at the resurrection, you know, we tend to think of the morning time with the resurrection, but the tomb was empty by the time people got there early in the morning. So whatever happened, happened during the night. And so, you know, she says, um, new life always starts in the dark, whether it's a seed in the ground or a baby in a womb, Jesus in the tomb, and I would add, or the nativity, new life always starts in the dark. Um, I actually find that incredibly comforting to think of God slipping into the world without any fanfare and obscurity, um, in darkness, unnoticed. And I think one of the reasons I find that helpful to me is that, um, you know, in times of light, but also, you know, also in times of darkness, um, this kind of tells us that God is with us. And um, even when we don't um, feel God's presence or God seems hidden from us or we don't feel anything happening within us, we can still trust that God is at work in and with and through us. Um, so, you know, I'll be honest, I would probably rather God act in pretty dramatic and fast ways, but that is not typically how God acts with me. So, um, you know, just like the Grand Canyon was carved out over 4 million years by the Colorado River, I just have to trust that God's calling in each moment, even as unnoticed as it may be, um, can still shape my own life in pretty powerful and salvific ways. Now, I also realize that we have to be open um, to that transformation, to that new life that comes. And this is where babies come in because I think babies teach us hospitality um, probably more than anything else. Although I do think that it can be um, any relationship really can teach us these things, but babies just, you know, um, to me teach it more than, than other relationships. Um, when we either have a baby or adopt a baby, you know, the first thing we do is try to make room for that baby. And we make room in multiple ways, you know, physically, you know, what was a guest bedroom all of a sudden becomes the baby's room. Um, we do it by making, carving out, you know, space in our schedules, in our routines for a baby. Um, we do it by um, making room financially for what it will cost and also emotionally because that kind of vulnerability, um, you know, comes with a loving relationship. So we do it in all those ways. And that is just the job of Advent, actually. Um, as we go through Advent before we get to Christmas, you know, what we're doing is um, preparing and making room. And the big question of Advent is, have I made room in my life and in my heart um, for God? So, um, so first of all, we make room. Second of all, what babies do for us is um, that kind of prepare us and make us hospitable to the unknown is um, they decenter us. And, um, you know, if we ever were the center of our whole world, <laughs> we certainly aren't after we have a baby. And I think the thing that we learn through babies is that um, being decentered doesn't mean that we have to lose our life in any way. In fact, it can be life-giving. And I always think about a friend of mine who was working in hospice and she had an experience that I've never forgotten and came and told me about it. Um, and I'll change names. <laughs> so, um, but she was, she was standing beside a young mother whose um, young son was dying and had been born with special needs. And she kept thinking about, you know, just think about all the things they had to give up. They don't get to do what, you know, normal young adults their age are doing. They've, you know, been taking care of this baby. And so she asked the mom, 
you know, I bet having Logan changed your life. And the mother said instantly, yeah, oh, yes, yeah. When we had Logan, we got our lives back. And, um, you know, what had happened is, as the woman talked, they had been, they had had this life of just partying, drinking, drugs, no direction. They have this child and all of a sudden their life takes on an intentionality and a meaning and, um, and a purpose. And it was life giving. So the idea that um, being decentered can actually be a life giving thing for us. Um, and then finally, I guess, um, children teach us radical hospitality. And my husband and I talk about this all the time. Um, you know, you're just given this baby and you don't know anything about it. You don't know who they are. You've changed your whole life for them, you know, and it's just placed in your hand and you're like, okay, so you get to know the baby and then they become a toddler and then they go to school and then they, you know, become a teenager and they want rightfully so their independence, then a young adult that you react to differently. And um, in all relationships, but I think especially in children, um, you are continually welcoming the person that they are becoming step by step by step over and over and over again. And then they get older and they bring home, um, you know, significant others and you open your heart to them. So, um, so yeah, so babies, I think, teach us um, a hospitable stance toward the unknown. So, there we go. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, Leslie, Beth, uh, does that raise any thoughts for you or anything you want to add or ask a question about whatever? Well, I really, um, really appreciate the um, connection between the dark as a generative place and God's arrival and new birth. I think, I think this has really profound implications for some of the language around race that's happening in our culture. I think still on a color spectrum, we are associating white um, colors, bright colors with virtue and um, we are still associating dark uh, with what is not preferable, what is dangerous. Um, you'll even hear people say, who are very intentional about trying to work on greater equity, you'll hear them talk about, we're really in a dark time. And what they mean is, you know, a time where we are <laughs> suffering. So I love what you've done to recognize the way scripture deploys its use of nighttime uh, for us. I think that can have some profound implications. And then, um, you know, drawing it to the emergence of a child. Um, in some ways, that is us our whole life, a child of God continuing to emerge. So really appreciated it. Thank you. I think, um, I think relationships um, that form us mm -hmm. and important key relationships in our lives just require, they teach us hospitality mm -hmm. and we have to change as people change mm -hmm. and, yeah. and still open our hearts again and again and again. Yeah. And the part that comes up for me as you were speaking, Terry, is um, just how in the moment children demand us to be right. So yes, making the room and then um, just, be in the moment, right? If there's a puddle, then you need to splash in the puddle. You don't need to worry about the cleanup afterwards. Um, and those are the sorts of gifts um, that, goodness, we we start to lose. And I, I think it's that orientation that uh, opens us more, grounds us more in the holiness in our midst, right? And um, as we're becoming, we sure can do a better job of it if we... Mm -hmm stop being stuck in our heads out there somewhere or only stuck in the past, right? The children have so much to teach us about the moment. When my husband um, 
when he published his dissertation, he put in there basically thank he he thanked our kids for not allowing him to miss the best parts of his life because they don't let you miss them. <laughs> yeah, you know, you are right there. So thanks. Leslie, how about you now? What would you like to offer the conversation? Well, thank you so much. I was um really uh thinking about the adequacy of space. And in some ways, um, Beth and Terry have really laid a wonderful foundation. Uh, as I've been thinking about the inn uh, where uh, the child, um, you know, there was no space in the inn, but there was space discovered. Um, so this idea of there being little or no room in an inn, I was really asking myself, as I read about that in scripture, how does that really come to me, um, not as an object, lesson, but sort of as a subjectifying force for my own life? And I was, I was thinking about the time where I've had little or no room. Um, and I think one of the things that often happens for me in my own human pilgrimage is I will experience regrets that are very important to me. And those regrets can pile up and take up space. Um, effectively leaving very little room. Um, I remember when I was called as pastor to the First Presbyterian Church of Waco, and I was replacing a beloved pastor of 30 years. And I remember feeling such regret that I was not him. Um, they were dealing with cancer. They were, um, some of them were dying. They were sending their children to college. They were doing all of these important things and he was not there. It was me. And, and I, I really had to mature through that. But, um, I think once I realized that my very regret that I was not him was preventing me from allowing them in <laughs> was, was quite was quite a revelation for me. Um, you know, open and relational um, theology really encourages us to have some courage about perpetual perishing and the ways in which things that have lived and given us their lessons like regret can perish and it's okay to let it go. Probably most importantly, because it provides space so I think regret was part of my experience. I think another part of my experience is anxiety and the way I'll fill up my own space with all of my worries and, you know, bar the door. <laughs> um, fear and anger uh, always contribute to my anxiety. And I think that what fear and anger are often trying to tell me is that I've not been in this place before. Um, I've not been where I'm going. I'm not, I've not been what, it, you know, what I'm experiencing. And so very often I've got lots of space inside, but I've barred the door um, because I want to defend from the adventure that living is. Um, and I'm 52 years old and I still have to say, oh, you've got the door barred. <laughs> so let's take the bar off the door. Um, I think um, finally, the other thing I was thinking about in terms of no room is this, this idea of anticipating, which is a very different sort of filling than regret, but the expectations that I have, um, the hopes that I have that are very much anchored to things like my memories, which is what Beth queued up for me earlier. Um, and you know, those anticipations have their own beauty <clears throat> but they often don't have the complexity they need to really be beautiful in a way that open and relational, <laughs> you know, theology would define beauty. So I find that even some of the things that are most precious to me have to go. Um, and I think that's what Terry was getting at when she was talking about, you know, the baby becomes a toddler, becomes a child, becomes a teenager, which is really hard to host. Um, so, you know, 
I think the thing that came to me the most out of my experience about this is I used to think I was a really good hostess. I mean, I would be like, yeah, come to my house. I'm awesome. I'll do it. And then I, then I watched my husband host and I came to understand that I was a much better stager than I was a hostess. Like I could clean the house and I could get the table and I could light the candles and I could give you a really gorgeous tablecloth and all of these things. But if you wanted me to sit down and to be present, not so much. Um, And I think that's sort of related to this anticipation, this expectation that even when I let people in my house, I wasn't always letting them in my heart or into my presence. So it's not a very Christmassy verse, but second Corinthians four, seven is one of my favorite really about the fact that we have these really fragile vessels in our lives that we fill up in the wrong ways sometimes, or we bar the door on, but really what we're meant to hold is this treasure and the cracks and the imperfections really perhaps exist so that things can flow rather than be held or hold out or whatever. So I really enjoyed thinking about um, this sort of a Christmas theme about an inn um, because I think like Terry and Beth, when it comes to the Christmas season, I really do want to be open enough that I can recognize Christ in um, the people who are moving towards this season alongside me. Thanks so much. Beth, Terry. Oh yeah. I've, <laughs> that stirs up so much. Um, you know, the person who introduced me to process thought, my dear friend, George would uh, talk about being a host, right? It, it, it baffled me for the first five years or more of um, having George in my life, but it, he made it his goal to invite people to his table um, who he was pretty sure wouldn't see eye to eye and wouldn't get along. And um, and he would just sit there and, and hold the space um, and, and keep it safe enough for everyone to be their true selves. Like I just, there are so many beautiful examples of how, um, how to be a person who holds that hospitable space and yeah it doesn't have nearly as much to do with um how gorgeous the table is although it, it doesn't hurt right it doesn't hurt I really like food. that part I don't... <laughs> it's it's important the Martha and Mary sort of thing um, I was hoping yeah. you wouldn't go there but it was on my mind yeah <laughs> anyway thanks for conjuring that up those are the stories <laughs> that shape us <laughs> Terry how about you yeah, I mean, I guess I was struck by um, the barring of the door. Mm-hmm. And um, and just how, just how making enough room isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You also have to be willing to be open. Mm-hmm. Which I think all of this came back to the present moment in some way. As you were saying, you know, uh, we we kind of began with um, a sense of home, mm-hmm. and we we dwelt in the darkness with the sense of new life um, that comes from babies, among other places, and we ended up with the the theme of anticipation, mm-hmm. and how anticipation can can be both um, anxiety ridden but also also a place of fresh possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always thought of the process tradition as a tradition that encourages us to have both roots and wings. Mm-hmm. The best we can have. Some sense of groundedness and things that are truly meaningful and some sense of openness to a future that is not yet, but can be. Uh, but like Terry just said, I've often wondered, what's the place from which you have your roots and you have your wings? It, it does seem to me it's the present moment. 
Mm-hmm. That's almost become a cliche. It's so almost hate to say it, but it still seems to me to be true. So how to have both roots and wings in the present moment? That's a kind of invitation to the Christian life I continually wrestle with. Um, as the season as the season unfolds and Christmas Day approaches and Christmas continues even after Christmas Day, uh, what hopes do you bring to the season? Do you have any hopes for for yourself, for your family, for our country? Are there any that that um, are particularly important uh, that you might like to share with anyone who lives who listens to this? Mm-hmm. I'll start with one, but I won't end with it. Uh, Beth, it was the image of George, the hospitable George. Yeah. Who has a table and he invites people that he doesn't even get along with, maybe, or doesn't see eye to eye with. But come sit at the table um, and I'll try to listen. Come. That, that's one of my hopes. Um, that I as a person and that even people in in this weird country, the United States, you're in Canada, Beth, I I hope that we Americans can can better learn to say, come, I'll sit sit at this table and I'll listen. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a hope that aches around the globe right now. And Mm. um, you know, it was my teenager this morning, one of my wise teenagers. Um, she does yoga every morning, so she wakes up happy and grounded. I, it blows my mind. <laughs> um, and I said, oh, it's my day off, and I've got five meetings, and my head is starting to spin. And uh, she said, wait, wait, mommy. Um, you're, not, you're not those thoughts in your head. Just take a moment. And it's, I guess it's a matter, like it's, so simple and I if I have a hope in this season it's can we just listen to the presence to the voices that are calling us back to to those roots because when we're rooted gosh then the wings can really start to um to take shape so yeah that's a hope I mean for myself certainly is how do I just keep listening how do I pay attention because I um, God's inviting us again and again and again um, to the gift and the beauty of this moment. And it doesn't take much life experience to know that um, even when things aren't as you would have them, there's so much, so much gift. Leslie, Terry, hope you bring. I think one of the things that I'm hoping for and thinking a lot about in light, and and it's very ordinary hope to be truthful, um, that the church, the religious community that I represent can really, um, I guess, long for, work for, relevance in the world. Um, And I think what that requires is a little less incubation of our own concerns. Um, So I think about that in very pragmatic ways, just the challenge that it is to do our worship right now is a very real thing that might really cause a recoiling and, uh, you know, a drawing in to feed our own souls at, at a time when it's much safer to gather. Um, but relevance is something I hope for. And I think when I say relevance, what I mean is something like Emmanuel, something like arrival to the world, the way we understand God to have arrived to the world in our tradition, knowing that that is not the only tradition that imagines and longs for God. So I think that's a not terribly well articulated answer to your question. I think that was plenty well articulated. (laughs) Okay. Terry. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, you know, it's clear and it's been clear that 
there are so many things in our world that need to change in the way that we do things and the way we treat one another in our institutions, in the church. And um, this isn't <laughs> the way that any of us would have chosen for things to be turned upside down. But I guess my hope is that in this time of, you know, everything being unhinged, loosened, um, that we don't waste it now and that we use it um, to be intentional about how we come back from this and let this be a moment that loosened everything up so that when it comes back together, it can do so differently mm -hmm. in a different way. Well, I think that each of you uh, has given us hope. And, and I know that uh, during this season, I think that when people listen to you and you reflect in your good and honest ways, um, that's hope. And that we have clergy like you that are honest and don't hide from the suffering, but deep and take us in deep places and wide places too, that's hope. So I wanna thank um, each of you and all of you for this Christmas blessing and wish you the best Christmas too. A really good one. It was thank really wonderful to be included. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jay. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye now. Conversations in Process is a co-production of the Cobb Institute and Open Horizons. If you'd like to support this podcast and help us realize our aim to advance wisdom, harmony, and the common good, please consider making a donation by visiting cob.institute. That's cob.institute and clicking on the donate button.